Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of House of the Dragon Episode 3, which shows how you can win over any cookout by serving up pork or crab. And thanks for your patience on this one. I don't get advanced screeners for the show, and we didn't want to force anyone to work on a holiday, but here it is! My scene-by-scene -scene analysis of all the visual details and deeper layers of meaning you might have missed in this episode. Now last week, when I went frame by frame through those opening credits, I promised that I would be laser focused on the opening titles in case anything got updated, and yep, there was one sneaky change! Last week, the bloodline on the green house House Hightower's side of everything flowed from Otto, his dial marked with the Hand of the King icon, to Alicent, marked with the Old Town Beacon icon, and then stopped there. But now the bloodline flows from Alicent and meets Viserys' bloodline, marking the birth of a new possible heir, young Aegon. As the camera pans down, you can see another dial waiting for Aegon, but for now it is still untouched by the blood, because he has not yet been named the heir. The opening image of the episode shows the sigil of House Valerion, the seahorse, on a burning sail as the triarchy ravages the Valerion fleet. This seahorse is not the seahorse fish that we know. It's a rearing mammalian horse with the lower half of a fish, and fins that resemble wings. Together with the embers, this foreshadows the true savior of this episode's closing, the fire of a flying Valerian dragon, Sea Smoke. Even its name parallels what we are currently seeing in its opening, Smoke on the Sea. And speaking of Ash and Ruin, Epic Hero Merch has a new shirt inspired by House of the Dragon called Ash and Ruin, and you can get it at EpicHeroShop.com. The Valerian Knight screams at Craig Vegas Drehar, the crab feeder. The sea snake will have your poxy fing head! By poxy effing head, he was referring to the fact that Gregus has grayscale, which you could see on his face and his shoulders last episode, hiding under his golden mask, which is also the mask of the Sons of the Harpy. Those are the assassins who threatened Daenerys' rule over Meereen in Game of Thrones Season 5. Now, these Game of Thrones winks are new to the character in this series. Presumably, Drehar acquired his harpy mask from piracy in the Free Cities, and if you remember in Game of Thrones, the men in the ruins of Valyria had grayscale, which does make Kragus, in a way, doubly represent representative of the rot that infests the Targaryen's ancestral home, and a future threat of the ambitions of their descendant Daenerys. This poor Valyrian knight hails the arrival of Prince Daemon and his dragon Caraxes. Save me! Oof, they even VFX the knight spewing up blood, and based on the length of its tail as it swipes out the bonfire to the right, it probably also swept away that guy's corpse. See, Damon's bravery has nothing to do with the good of the realm, it's all about his pride. The crab feeder and his men hide in their caves, and this is exactly how the Dornish managed to stave off the Targaryen dragons during the failed conquest of Dorne. Also, the fact that they took out Aegon's sister wife Rhaenys and her dragon Meraxes with a scorpion weapon definitely helped as well. Now, as we fade in on the king's feast, the first words we hear are those of young Aegon, <laughs> and what's for dinner? Pork! Foreshadowing a game-changing game that will be brought in during the hunt. Now notice how the nobles say, He has your hair, your grace. <laughs> he does have my hair. He has your eyes, your grace. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> and you have my nose, don't you? And baby Aegon pulls away from Viserys' hand because notice how throughout this scene and throughout this episode, Viserys has now lost two of his fingers on his left hand. It's like with every episode, a new piece of this guy is dropping off. And as always, the Valyrian steel dagger of Aegon the Conqueror, which yes, again, plays a huge role throughout Game of Thrones, continues to jut into frame, which is especially ironic now since his withering left hand would be the one to draw that dagger. Pretty soon, all that's gonna be able to grab it is a stump. It's just as if every year of his rule renders him less and less worthy to carry Aegon's legacy represented by that dagger. Also, yes, I have to point this out. The frame that we cut to Aegon, that kid is totally looking at the camera. These child actors, they always see us. Otto Hightower speaks with his older brother, Hobart, Lord of Old Town. We actually saw him swearing fealty to Rhaenyra in episode one, which makes his assumption that Aegon would be named new heir pretty brazen. He's the king's firstborn son. I don't know that his grace sees it so clearly. Then it lies with you to make him see it. Ah, so we see how Otto pressuring his daughter Allison to influence the king is really a trait passed down to him from his Hightower elder. Tyland Lannister is the new master of ships, replacing Corlys, who resigned last episode. Notice his Lannister lion. Tyland and his twin brother Jason Lannister are both played by actor Jefferson Hall, who played Sir Hugh of the Vale in season one of Game of Thrones. I love how he plays Tyland as a worrywart and Jason as a proud braggart. Shots later in this episode actually Winklevoss him in twice, side by side. But there's a fun edit out of this scene. Can someone tell me? Where in the seven hells Rhaenyra might be? 
Under the dragon's eye. Yeah, the jump cut to the bard song answers the king's question with an answer he might not like. His daughter Rhaenyra is under the dragon's eye, as if she might be the destined descendant in Aegon's Song of Ice and Fire dream. Additionally, Rhaenyra is in the godswood beneath the red leaves of the weirwood tree, anointing her destiny from the old gods as well. The divine forces in Westeros that predate the Targaryens, which plays a key symbolic role later. Now, this bard's song is about Nymeria and her 10,000 ships the historical warrior queen who was referenced in this same location, episode one. You can actually see the name Nymeria when the page turns at the top of that paragraph. So either Rhaenyra had this book mended to replace the page that she tore out, or she could be reading a new book about this person. Who, if you think about it, would likely be the only woman in her life that she now feels companionship with. And by the way, HBO is developing a Nymeria 10,000 Ships spinoff series, so you know, the show is just trying to incept Nymeria in our brains. Oh, you want a 10,000 Ships show now? Well, we got one for you. Now this singer is named Samwell like Samuel Tarly, who in Game of Thrones coins a title, A Song of Ice and Fire, for his history of these recent conflicts, which is ironic that he would pick the same phrase Aegon the Conqueror used to describe the dream of White Walkers. But the fact that we focus on this bard so much in the scene, like him stretching his sore hand, makes me wonder if this could actually be the show's version of the character Mushroom, the mummer in Fire and Blood, who provided the salacious details of the subjective historical account that George R. R. Martin intended Fire and Blood to be. Naming him Samuel could be a nod to that meta aspect of an in-universe character later playing a role in documenting the history of it. Now the castle walls torches are held by dragon mouths so that the torches when lit would look like a dragon breathing fire. I love that touch. More tasteful decor than the literal bestiality porn on every other surface of this castle. Whereas before these two young women laid together beneath this tree, even the actresses admitted that they were doing so with an intentional flirty undertone. Now Rhaenyra will not even look at the queen, yet the blocking suggests she's using the eyes of the face in the weirwood tree trunk as the eyes in the back of her head. In a way, Alicent is under the dragon's eye. Viserys and Alicent encourage Rhaenyra to bear children. It's not so bad. The days are long, but Aegon came quickly and without fuss. Yeah, those nurses got some tea. Clearly Aegon's birth was rough for this teenage bride. And like many queens in the Middle Ages, especially ones now focused on popping out the next kid, she doesn't really get to spend much time mothering her toddler. Young Aegon looks at camera again and pushes that dragon figurine on the floor. All screw like children when they're being slaughtered. <laughs> Your Grace, he also has your love of dropping dragon toys. Yes, in this episode, Rhaenyra goes from hating the sound of a screaming boar, the editing of her line there, sinking with Aegon's shout, to, at the end of this episode, stabbing a screaming boar. I wonder who Rhaenyra was visualizing stabbing there. As they arrive at the hunting camp, we see the red keep in the background of the shot. Compared to the Game of Thrones season one scenes that take place in the King's Wood, I just love the visual context we get here to anchor us in the setting. And a nice when your TV show's got bigger budget. Master of Laws Lionel Strong applauds their arrival, flanked by his two sons, Larry Strong with a club foot, and his brother, Sir Harwin Breakbone Strong, who's gonna be an important character throughout this series. Hobart Hightower declares, Hail, hail, Edward the Conqueror Babe, second of his name. Second of his name is the title of this episode, and for Hobart to shout it here in front of everyone is a huge breach of protocol, as Aegon would not be called Aegon II, aka second of his name, until the king officially names him an heir, which he has not done yet. Despite the patriarchal customs of this society, Rhaenyra remains the proclaimed heir, whom, again, Hobart swore fealty to. So that conflict of whether Aegon should be the second of his name is at the heart of this episode. And while it is his birthday that they're celebrating, really this episode is the name day for other Targaryens, each of whom entered this world in a new way by the episode's end, baptized in fire and blood. As Rhaenyra walks into the red tent, we see her new hair braid at the back of her head, which matches the interlocking circles of the Valerian steel necklace that Damon gave her. This one always got eyes in the back of her head. Rhaenyra walks in on Kira Lannister dropping some exposition. Lady Giles reported to have been abducted when one of Lord Swan's ships sailed through the Stepstones. What will happen to Lady Joanna? She's to be sold to a pillow house in the free cities, if you believe the rumors. Joanna Swan was kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery and Lys, but in the text becomes a beloved courtesan named the Black Swan and essentially rules the city of Lys. So don't worry, Joanna's gonna be fine. Lady Jocelyn Redwine gets shut down by Rhaenyra. Now have you served the one with late Lady Redwine, why eating cake? Now, actually, before Elena Tyrell, our heroine from Game of Thrones, married into the Tyrell family, she actually came from House Redwine. So this dog-loving woman is her distant ancestor. Jason Lannister puts the moves of Rhaenyra by bragging about Casterly Rock. The rock is thrice the height of the high tower in Old Town, taller still than the wall in the north. 
Yeah, it's fitting that Jason would brag about how tall the castle is when famously Casterly Rock's best features are really the tunnels and mines within the rock that not many people know about. As tall as the castle is, Rhaenyra could always fly higher than it on Cyrax, which Jason even knows that she did because Rhaenyra visited Casterly Rock with her mom as a girl. I just bring this up to compare Jason to another boastful character like Damon, a guy whose greatest strength so far in the series has been his knowledge of the secret tunnels and passageways hidden within the castle beneath the surface. And I love how when Jason first approached Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra is framed in the raging bonfire behind her. Fire has always been a symbol of strength for the Targaryen family, and it's almost like Rhaenyra is able to brush off Jason because she is fueled by this fire. Fire that she doesn't yet let explode out of her. Now those Targaryens are not only known for their platinum hair, but how about that smooth, smooth skin? No dark under eye circles or blemishes on any of them. Now they have the maesters to thank for their good skin, but for the rest of us, there's Geology. Geology is a 13-time award-winning skincare company that creates simple, effective personalized skincare products. You got your everyday face wash, your repair and night cream, your vital morning face cream, and your nourishing eye cream. Just click the link in the description and take a 30 second quiz. Tell Geology about your skin and their team of dermatologists will design a regimen just for you that ships direct to your door. Their products are great for acne, wrinkles, or any other skin concerns. You'll be sent a 30 day trial, so whether you're getting wind burn from riding dragons or just look a little tired from staying up late breaking down House of the Dragon episodes, you'll have a plan for looking good. Just the simplest of it all is my favorite part. They're ramping up to release brand new hair care products like all new co-wash, shampoo, and conditioner. Be sure to let them know that you're interested when you fill out the diagnostics so you can be the first to know when it releases. They're offering a crazy deal right now. You get 70% off on their 30-day five-piece trial kit. Head to geology.com to get 70% off your 30-day trial when you use the code ROCKSTARS70 or just click the link below. That's geology.com promo code ROCKSTARS70 to save 70% off off your 30-day trial. Otto breaks up Viserys and Rhaenyra's fight with... The Royal Huntsman has sent a report, Your Grace. There's been a sighting of a white heart. The stag is the king of the king's wood, Your Grace, a regal portent for Prince Aegon's name day. Yes, the white stag is a creature of legend in the King's Wood. It was actually the same stag that Robert Baratheon was pursuing on his fateful hunt in A Game of Thrones. Sir Howland Sharp later tells the king... Right. Before the dragons rolled over Westeros, white heart was the symbol of royalty in these lands. I've never been one for signs of importance, Your Grace, but if the gods did wish to show their favor. So for Viserys, this stag represents one symbol of fate grounded in nature, something real, as opposed to his unreliable dragon dreams. It's a sign of power that preceded Aegon's conquest that still eludes this Targaryen king. During their time together, Sir Criston tells Rhaenyra about his name being added to the White Book. You remember, that's the book containing the Hall of Famer Kingsguard Knights that we saw in the Game of Thrones series. Jason Lannister gives Viserys a golden spear, a Lannister weapon to kill a stag, the symbol of House Baratheon, obviously some symbolic parallels there with the future Lannister treachery against King Robert on his hunt. Otto suggests Rhaenyra marry young Aegon, ugh, while Lionel Strong smartly suggests Leonor Valerion. Lionel's pick would heal the division with the Valerions, the wealthiest house, while Otto's pick would prevent a future succession crisis and civil war. Perhaps Lionel just sees that crisis as inevitable and wants Valerion closer to the crown, rather than having them on the outside looking in. A boar attacks Sir Criston and Rhaenyra, which we know rulers should be worried about. And of course, it was a boar that fatally wounded Robert Baratheon, but Rhaenyra stabbed stabs this boar to death. She's unafraid of its childlike squeals, and she coats herself in blood. The fire that was gradually building Rhaenyra throughout this episode finally explodes and takes the form of blood. And so through fire and blood, her true self emerges. And we cut directly from this to the shot of Viserys by the campfire with the flames crackling in the foreground, as if he's trying to draw strength from these flames. But without getting a single drop of blood on him this episode, he feels powerless. Many in my line have been dragon riders. Very few among us have been dreamers. What is the power of a dragon? It's the power of prophecy. Ah, so we see how Viserys sees the distinction between dragon riders and dreamers. Dragon riders like Daemon and Rhaenyra act brashly and overwhelm their enemies with shock and awe, whereas dreamers are more cautious. They use their belief in prophecy to try to stay a step ahead. For Viserys, it wasn't Aegon's conquest that inspired him, it was Aegon's dream. And before that, Daenys' dream that saved his family from the Doom of Valyria. Viserys saw more power in those dreams and fashioned himself a dreamer, but now he's beginning to doubt himself. Because as he shares with Alicent his dream of a son wearing Aegon's crown, the dream that he told Emma 
about, he now admits that he only dreamt that image one time, and he could never again will it into a recurring prophecy-style dream. And it's interesting to note that Viserys' dream showed Aegon wearing the Conqueror's crown, not the crown he's currently wearing. The crown worn in the series by Viserys and his predecessor Jaehaerys, which are seen on their dials in the opening credits. That is not Aegon's crown. Aegon's crown is a circlet of Valyrian steel with square-cut rubies in it. That crown encircles the dial that represents Aegon the Conqueror that starts off the opening credits and was last worn by Maegor the Cruel. Without spoiling anything, Aegon the Conqueror's ruby crown does come back in this narrative. But for now, Viserys thought naming Rhaenyra heir was his way of quitting that whole dream obsession. But now, with Aegon's birth, his dream is actually coming true again. And now this White Heart legend is supporting that destiny. He doesn't know which signs to heed. So it actually comes to a bit of relief to Viserys when Breakbone Strong is trapped at different normal stag. It may not be white, no grace. He's a big lad. Viserys uses the Lannister spear to stab the stag, but he misses the mark and requires a repeated jab. It's actually pretty pathetic, a contrast to Rhaenyra and Sir Criston, who faced a beast without any help and killed it a lot faster. The way Viserys puts down this stag, it's almost like he's putting himself down. Also, I love this detail. Notice his left ring and pinking finger are lifted in his glove because those fingers have rotted off and those parts of the glove are empty. So when your fingers aren't filling the glove, it just kind of sticks outward. I love this detail because the actor, Patty Considine, had to consciously act it with his fingers out to imply empty glove fingers just to show attention to detail appreciated by only the folks who break these down on YouTube. Rhaenyra looks down over the Kingswood camp and in this same unbroken shot of her gliding over it all, the camera pans over to reveal the legendary White Heart presenting itself to her. <laughs> Yes, the white whale that eluded both her king father and will elude Robert Baratheon in the future appears to this Targaryen heir who is anointed in blood. The fact that Rhaenyra spares it though is interesting because you could totally imagine her descendant Daenerys slaying that white heart and proudly dragging it back into camp to show off her power. But this move by Rhaenyra can be seen as a gesture of restraint or compassion, but I see it as a heedlessly contrarian refusal to play the games of her father and his men. She's literally over all of them. So by letting this white heart flee, she leaves it as a secret known only to her, while to her father, it remains a maddening mystery that he'll never know whether or not it was even real. All her father has now are his bullshit dragon dreams, but Rhaenyra knows as a secret in her own heart that she had a physical sign from nature that her claim to the crown is destined. And I cannot help but see a parallel with another queen in a stag, the climax of the 2006 film, The Queen, with Helen Mirren as Queen Elizabeth II shooing away a long sought after stag during a hunt to mirror her softening compassion for Princess Diana. Rhaenyra instead returns with a victory that was all her own, and pork is on the menu! Unlike her father, Rhaenyra is covered in blood, proving to all these lords watching that her kill was not ceremonial. She earned it. I love how particularly Breakbone Strong gives her a huge grin as he skins that rabbit. Otto tells Alicent that Aegon should become heir over Rhaenyra. The road ahead is uncertain, but the end is clear. Aegon will be king. I love this as a meta line for this whole prequel series. Like you can look at a family tree and know where this ends. I mean, even if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know where it ends. But it's really the uncertain road ahead, the snaking bloodlines at branch and how they flood stuff that's gonna make this interesting to watch. Onto the Stepstones, there is a 52 second shot showing three Valyrian ships and Daemon's dragon Caraxes in a battle against the Triarchy forces. One of those fireballs hits the center of a ship and sinks it. Another fireball appears to go through the gap in the sails of the leftmost ship. So it's really by luck that it was able to escape that. Corliss says, We must press the attack. Continue sending the dragons. Yes, he said dragons. A little signal that during all this time, they definitely had more than one dragon at their disposal. They had Caraxes and Leonor's dragon, Sea Smoke. So it's not like Sea Smoke came out of nowhere. Corliss debates strategy with his son, Leonor. Remember, he was the younger kid of the tourney with his sister, Lyanna, in episode one. He's also talking with Corliss's brother, Vaymond. He's the one who sent the notice to the crown. Notice how their map board uses crab claws for Kragus' forces, as well as fish jawbones and other fish figurines. But when Leonor suggests an offering of flesh to draw out Kragus from the caves, Damon arrives in that moment and plops his dragon-designed helmet on the table. Even though he hasn't made this decision yet, he is gonna end up volunteering himself as the bait, and his helmet in this moment serves as his figurine, putting himself on the game board. Damon reads the king's letter and then pummels the messenger, Adam, and later we hear Viserys' voice over reading it as Damon rows alone toward the shore. So we realize that the only thing stopping him from doing this until now was just his pride. He's only moving on to this last resort tactic because his brother's about to steal the victory from him. As Viserys even said, Damon would sooner die than let that happen. 
happen. And he's about to risk doing that. And I love this shot of Damon rowing out from behind burning ship wreckage, making it look as though he is emerging from the fire. Just another example of a Targaryen this episode being anointed from fire and blood. Now, Damon appears to surrender, and Kragus watches them with only one eye since that other eye has been rotted by the grayscale. Maybe that's why he had trouble seeing sea smoke and all that smoke and fog, because he didn't forget he was searching the sky for those dragons. It's just this dragon had a convenient color tone to it. Damon cuts through the Triarchy men with the sword Dark Sister, but eventually his plot armor runs out and he gets tripped up by one soldier and then plugged with a bunch of arrows. When he's pinned, we actually get a few extreme close ups of Dark Sister's hilt. You can see how the cross guard forms outstretched dragon wings. I love all the little production design details of the show. As the screen fills with more and more smoke and fog, it masks the reveal of Sea Smoke, Leonor's dragon, colored silver gray, and releasing a roar that's actually pretty unlike the roars of Cyrax and Caraxes. Remember, is the son of the Targaryen queen who never was, Rhaenys. And since she's a dragon rider, her kids are dragon riders. Now, Sea Smoke as a dragon is a bit younger and is more targeted with its attacks. Notice how it breathes a perfect U shape around Damon, but doesn't torch him in particular? Whereas Caraxes just stomped a friendly earlier. Sea Smoke even grabs four Triarchy fighters from a melee mess, including both sides, and manages to avoid grabbing any of their own men. It's kind of like blind reaching a bag of Starbursts and pulling out four pinks. What are the odds of that? And Damon emerges from the cave with the top half of Kragus' torso. Hopefully grabbing part of the skin that didn't have grayscale on it. But like his niece Rhaenyra, he is fully covered in blood of his hunted game, earning the loyalty and respect of all in sight. Both Damon and Rhaenyra, without any help from the king, have brought home the bacon and scored victories through fire and blood. But I will leave you with my favorite detail from this entire final sequence that takes up 12 and a half minutes at the end of the episode. Throughout all of this, Matt Smith never utters a single word of dialogue. All of his emotions he conveys through his face and his physicality. In fact, the last line that he spoke in this episode was in the opening scene when he called out Kragus from the caves. It's almost like he was letting that reverberate until the man was able to accomplish his task. Thank you so much for watching these analyses. I really try to dig into the visual details and symbolism. So for all of you so patient and willing to wait a day or two longer, please, please, please do me a favor and share these videos with everyone you know who watches House of the Dragon. I'm really just in trying to enhance everyone's viewing experience. And again, thank you for joining me every week as we do that. You can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EAVoss. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.